Hi everyone, um, I'm Hong, the Android engineer from Toronto. Uh, today I will talk about my experience that I went through when Carousel app. Um, yeah. So basically, just some tips and like what my experience was when I took an Android app for Carousel. So for those who uh, don't know, Carousel is a marketplace to buy and sell stuff. And uh, this is a screenshot of our Android app, the front page of the Android app. Um, so yeah, I'll go through a few things. The first one will be the tools. Um, so tools are quite important. And the tool will help you um, code the Android app. Um, yeah. When I first started, I used Vim as my ed main editor. Um, personally, I didn't really like Eclipse that much. So, yeah, and I didn't know that IntelliJ was an option for Android. Um, and also, I used the AMBuild system instead of Maven because it was quite simpler than Maven. Um, yeah, for the pros, right, um, you can actually learn the Android structure and you learn how the build system works. It's okay for small projects, but then um, when the project grew, it's quite hard to navigate around using me. So I have so I have no choice but to um, move to Eclipse. Yeah, and the cons is that it takes more time to go around. There's no autocomplete in Vim. It's harder to debug and there's no layout preview. So fast forward um, to the early release of Android Studio. It was announced in Google I.O. And at that time, migration from Eclipse to hard as is quite buggy. So I had to stop until the late alpha release. Um, then I was able to migrate the entire app to Android Studio. Um, in, the alpha re in the alpha release of Android Studio, um, not a lot of things still, the UI stuff doesn't really work well yet. So you really have to learn like the greater build system. You need to know like, how the greater works and stuff like that. Um, but then there are of pros. You have multiple screen size preview in the layout editor. You have values previews like strings preview, dimension preview in the code, and also the draw of the reviews. Yeah. Um, the cons is that there's occasional crashes. Um, it's quite rare though, so and Android Studio has auto save feature, so it didn't really present that. And the second one is that um, there was few libraries supported. So, but then over time, most of them will be moved to Maven Center and J Center. So now it's it's really good already. Um, yeah, one important aspect for me was uh, navigation. Um, so um, yeah, you navigate between classes in your own project uh, or navigate to Android source code, provided that you have downloaded the source code and the library source code. So if you spend a lot of time uh, navig navigating around, then you will reduce your um, productivity. So here are just some uh, shortcuts that I usually use to navigate around. Um, command O and Shift Command O is to open file by class name or by file name in your project. Um, command E and Shift Command E will show you the recently opened and edited files. And Shift Command E will open the action. So basically you can split, you can type in like split vertically, split horizontally, and yeah, it will, will bring you straight to the command. And the last two is you just navigate around the cursor position. Uh, like Shift Command Backspace will bring you to the last edited position, no matter where you are in the project. Yeah, uh, and the one below is to for go backward and forward. Another important one is um, Command E. It will show you the declaration. Um, basically, it is a class class name. It will show you your class definition. It is object. It will show you the it's a variable, it will show you the object. Um, it is a method, it will show you a method declaration. 
or the other way around, it will show you when in the project uh, this method was used. Um, yeah. Prokup was quite important as well. Um, this was done after I migrated to Android Studio. And what does it do? It removes uh, unused code. Yeah. So basically, you reduce a play size from that reduced um, unused code. And also, it provides some simple code obfuscation. At first, it may sound scary to implement uh, ProGuard. Like, what if you spread some things um, and you release it to like millions of people? So, but then it's not really that hard. You can go to this uh, ProGuard website. They have a complete example for a complete Android application. And the example will give you a detailed explanation of why, like, what choice of what choice of class should you keep not to be obfuscated? Yeah. Some of the examples for our, from our own app is um, yeah. the first one is green mapping. This one basically map your original code and the obfuscated code. You will need this file um, to, for you to give up the crashes that you receive from the user. Keep attributes, source file, and the line on the table. This one will be helpful if you have an external re crash reporting system like uh, Crash Detect. In the overview dashboard, you will see the source number and line on the table, so you don't really have to use the mapping app, and you can just go straight to your source code. And this is used for the Android support library. Um, yeah, these are, you can see that um, some of the things, some of the class that I choose to keep are those that usually used in the manifest or the layout yeah. to be safer. And next would be the test devices that I use. For physical device, I use my personal phone. And also, yeah, app tag is mentioned because it's helped me in one instant, which will be mentioned later. And for emulator, I use Gini Motion. Gini Motion is fast and it has different API for you to test against. You can also zoom on the screen um, yeah, to see like pixel perfect details for the app. So next will be the challenges, uh, the problems that I face when I build the Android app. The most thing is support back to API 10. Ginger, great. Um, new app shouldn't need to support API 10 anymore, but for us, we supported it like very long ago. So we probably have to wait until it's less than one percent to drop the support. Yeah, but then there are different issues. The first one is like different behaviors on different API level. Let's say if you want to match match two children, child, uh, two children size in a view, how would you do it? Um, one way to do it is you use a frame layout, and the two of your child views will match parent while the parent view will just web content. The problem is that it only works on honeycomb and above. So it turned out that um, this feature is only implemented on honeycomb above or frame layout. Uh, so how would you do it on Gio Grid? You can put it in a you can try to use a different layout, such as relative layout. And you can use one child to a light top and a light bottom to another child. Um, this is not really a good way to do it, but yeah, it works. And you can put it in a different folder, layout folder. So your Android project will have like layout, a V10, and the rest will use a default layout. But then if you know the exact layout, you can also create a custom view group for it. Yeah. Another one is um, Score listener. How so? How how will you create a score listener for score views? Um, I see a lot of people suggest this. Um, get view tree observer and you add your own score share listener. It works, but the listener is not fired in JavaScript. Um, yeah. So view tree observer is also not really a good way to do this. As this one is shared across all views in your activities. So the right way to do it would be extend scroll view. You can set up, you can create a calling interface and send it yeah, in the on scroll chain method. 
um, most of the time, uh, all of this may not apply, but it's just a general idea that um, different API will have some different behaviors for some of the weird things that you do. So next will be the material design backport. Um, while most, most of them are provided by the support library, um, native shadow is not. So how do you on so on Lollipop there's a native shadow provided um, with optimal performance. So how would you do it on pre Lollipop? Um, card views is provided by the support library and it comes with shadow size. The problem with card view is that it has padding and so basically your view cannot fully match the bearing width and it will have some padding for the shadow to be drawn on. Another way to do it is custom shadow as a foreground applied to the view below or above of the view that you want to have shadow. And this is actually done in the Google I.O. app. So yeah. What about stuff only available in higher API version? Um, you can only like find another way using lower API version or use a support library if available. But to note that um, for support library, some of the methods are no op on the older version APIs. So basically it does nothing. Yeah. And ignore older version. Yeah. This some means that, let's, let's say an example is that uh, you want to show and hide something using some um, complicated animation. It is not uh, doable in GeoGrid, you can just show and hide it immediately and show animation on the higher API version. Um, we also encounter uh, a lot of manufacturer bugs because um, they tend to implement their stuff differently from the AOSP. Um, yeah. The step I usually go to about this is um, you reproduce a bug, make a fix and test a fix. So let's go through one example of it. This is quite a famous problem. At Compact B7 crashed by Samsung and it was reported on Google issues as um, no class definition file error menu builder. Um, I wasn't able to reproduce this problem because I don't have the phones. So I found a type where it has um, a lot of different physical devices for you to test on. And yeah, I managed to reproduce it. And also, I, after that, the next step is I find out the cause. It will mention that um, if you change your menu builder class name, it will work. But how would you do that? So yeah, I, luckily we use Bogart. So Bogart actually obfuscate the code and change the class name for us. So basically it's fix the crash. Yeah. Another problem is this signify k next limit. Um, it may look strange to some people. But next file has a limit of 65k methods. Um, app usually has no business of over 65k text limit. But uh, if you if you pass that limit, then how will you go about it? Um, yeah, Bogart Bogart help you reduce this method cost. But even if Bogart cannot help you, then you have to go this multi-text route. Basically, you have to multiple text file in the app. This was not really. Good though, because multi has a lot of limitations and bugs. But at least try to remove some unnecessary code. Um, yeah. So if, let's say you have a library and you only need one very small functionality in a library, you should extract it or write it yourself. Yeah. Another culprit of that is the Google Play service. It has over 20k methods count. So, but recently, Google Play service has been split into multiple smaller uh, projects, so it's helped. Yeah. Some of the current and upcoming things that uh, we are doing, um, the material design, of course, um, the guideline can be found on google.com slash design, and it's recently updated, and it will evolve two times, so you should look at it um, once in a while. Our designer also follow the material design and our app also start make using the uh, using it for the some of the redesign page or new features. So how would you implement the material design? 
support library is the way to go. Um, it has many different um, material design patterns like swipe to refresh, cut view, toolbar, or the palette. Um, so recently, the, the support library is updated with even more features. Some of it will, will go through. Material, material team dialog. Um, yeah. So previously, before Lollipop, we had to create our own custom dialog for the whole host style. But now it's a headache because we have to change everything to the material team. So if you use a, if you use a, like let's say if you use alert dialog builder before, you can simply change the package to the support to the support version of alert dialog, and all your dialog will be material on all platform, yeah, all API versions. So there's no need for any pointers get code anymore. And also widget thinking. Um, most widgets are now will be automatically tinted using the color color theme attribute that you put in the in your theme source. Um, so it will work unless you have uh, your custom view, custom view, then you will have to extend the according um, app compact version of the widget. Uh, let's say app compact text view or app compact button. Um, Previously, it was not supported also, so we have to kind of like use a color filter to do it. Um, but now it's supported, and the, the library actually does that for older version of the API. So on the, on the Lollipop, you will use the built-in Lollipop functions, and on pre Lollipop, Lollipop you will fall back to color filters. And if you read color filters, um, actually use something called Porter Duff, and it's quite interesting, you can read on it. Uh, online. Again, no more boil boilerplate code to write. Another one would be um, team. Android team can be set, can be now set for any view. Um, and all child view will inherit from the parent team. Uh, a good example of this is the toolbar. So let's say if your app has the theme.compare.light version, um, the app compare light team. Basically, if you don't do anything, if you don't have this Android team um, dark action bar, the action bar will be dark, and all your text will be dark as well. So basically, you can what you can do is you can set the Android team on the toolbar, and you tell it to use dark action bar instead of light, instead of following the the entire app team. And basically, the text view will also follow the same team and will be light. Um, also, if you notice, right, um, there's this called team overlay. Why is, why, why is the difference between team and team overlay? Um, team actually applies globally to your entire activity if you set it in the manifest. Um, team overlay is used to override the attribute on top of that team. So if you put team.acompact.actionbar here, yeah, it won't work. You have to use a team overlay version of it. Um, you also notice that the toolbar is actually kind of like a view group, um, a frame layout. So you can put any view inside it as well. You can put a linear layout inside the toolbar and have other views inside it. Yeah. Or you can use the third party libraries. Um, for us, we use a snack bar library. It's quite well made, so there was no problem. Yeah. So the thing is, Today, the new Google I.O. app scheduled for this year was released. And if you look at the decompile version uh, of the APK, you can see that the support has some interesting new um, widget in it, like floating action button, uh, snack bar. So basically, you don't have to rely on third-party libraries anymore, and you can start using the Google first-party provided. Yeah, it's always better. Um, some of the upcoming things that we are doing and looking at now. Annotation processing API. Um, this is quite a big thing now with uh, a lot of libraries relies on it. Um, we will go through some of the examples of the libraries and see why it, will, it actually helps in your development. First one is the Dagger 2. Um, Dagger 2 is a dependency injection. The first version of it was made by Square. Um, 
and the second version was took over by Google. Why is that different? Um, Dagger 2 has no reflection. So basically, the performance of it is as good as handwritten code. So what does dependency injection help you? It will help in the, like if you have a big team and you work on the same thing together, you don't really have to care about how something is implemented. And you also help with testing. Um, yeah. Just some example of it. So basically, if you want to inject an object, you are just annotate it with the inject word, and you don't really have to know how it's created. So how does it work? Um, you need to create a module. The module will provide you with the object itself, and after that, you have to create another thing called component. Component is something um, similar to object graph in Dagger One, if you are familiar with it. Um, yeah. So basically, you will tell the basically component is an interface that tells you how everything is connected. Um, yeah, you can see it is use something like that, and this is how it is initialized. You there will be a Dagger sample component found, generated when you compile the code, and you can use it to build to build the component. So once the component is built, you can call the inject method. You can call the inject method to so that your so that the inject will work, the inject annotation will work. Um, another thing is um, auto value. So if you know um, to create a proper value type class, you have to implement like um, object. Uh, you have to implement the methods like equals hash code or to string. Um, so it's actually quite a lot of boilerplate code you have to write. So what does what auto value does is it will help you create a immutable class type just by just just through the annotation processing. Um, example taken from the repo, you can see that um, yeah, you just need to annotate the class, the abstract class with auto value and you give them some of the abstract method and all of this will be generated for you the constructor, the method name, the method number of legs and other methods mentioned earlier like to string hash code uh, you may ask why this is useful for Android right? we will, I will show you in the next example um, if you already know parcelable has better performance over serializable and it's a preferred way to pass data around activities and such. So if anyone using parcelable, right, um, you think that um, you think that it takes a lot of effort to write parcelable codes. Um, yeah, especially if there's a parcelable inside another parcelables, or like a list of parcelable inside another parcelables. So yeah.